Bueno, pues vamos a empezar ya. En primer lugar, agradecer a, a Fide que nos haya permitido albergar la presentación del manual sobre Ligatec. Agradecer a Marcus que haya venido desde Alemania para presentar el manual que él, con otros dos autores, ha coeditado y nosotras en el año 67 hemos tenido la oportunidad de colaborar con un pequeño y breve capítulo. Y, y deciros que el acto va a ser el 10, eh, por Marcus, que todavía no ha aprendido español, aunque aprenderá, porque ayer te probé que le encanta España, es muy muy fan, y yo creo que en muy poco tiempo estarás hablando fluido español. Pero vamos a hacerlo en inglés, solo que yo voy a hacer esta pequeña introducción ahora, y lo que voy a hacer es aprovechar eh, que Carlos Fernández, que está entre nosotros, eh, posiblemente el periodista más eh, sabio ahora mismo en esta nueva disciplina de la innovación y la tecnología especializada en nuestro sector, pues tuvo la deferencia de aceptar hacer una reseña sobre esta obra, lo cual es un gran esfuerzo. No sé cuánto tiempo Carlos ha tardado en leerla, pero la obra, que no sé si la tenemos aquí, deberíamos tener encima de la mesa, son 400 páginas en una letra que para los mayores de 40 resulta compleja, ya lo aviso, yo me pongo las gafitas, pero tras dos páginas me canso. Eh, la obra no es barata, o sea que es una obra para gente pudiente, son 200 algo euros, eh, pero es una obra magnífica. Es decir, que si tenéis la oportunidad de adquirirla, aunque también es complicado porque se acaba muy a menudo, y se acaba porque es una obra casi única, es una obra innovadora, era muy necesaria, en alemán hay otra que ha salido hace poco, pero realmente no hay prácticamente compendios sobre esta materia, simplemente por lo novedoso que tiene y porque no hay tanta gente capaz de escribir sobre ella. Así que enhorabuena Marcus por haber tenido la iniciativa junto a mi hija y al señor Happy de sacar esta obra adelante. Y os voy a explicar eh, lo que vais a encontrar en la obra apoyándome en la reseña que amablemente, como he dicho, preparó Carlos. Pues la obra eh, eh, tiene ocho partes y os voy a leer los títulos de cada parte. La primera se llama La transformación digital. En esa parte vais a encontrar qué es la Legal Tech, algo que cada uno hemos definido como nos ha parecido y aquí lo que hacen es contarnos que hay muchas definiciones. Un segundo tema en el que se adentra es las taxonomías, porque es muy interesante y muy importante entender qué categorías de vida te hay para luego decidir, pues bueno, me interesa esta, me interesa esta otra, etc. Y aquí de nuevo nos van a contar que hay diversas clasificaciones de la vida teca. Como he dicho, en este campo todo está por decir, es decir, cualquiera de nosotros en cierta forma podemos hacer doctrina. Y yo de hecho os invito a que analicéis, estudiéis, reflexionéis y compartáis vuestro saber y vuestras ideas. Porque creo que falta, eh, falta mucho por decir. Eh, en, en esa parte también nos hablan de lo que está pasando, que es muy importante. Eso es lo que te hace despertarte y darte cuenta de que el despacho de toda la vida debe de empezar a pensar si puedes seguir haciendo las cosas como toda la vida. En la segunda parte nos van a hablar de Ligatec y Big Law. Y en la tercera de Ligatec y pequeños y medianos despachos. Es una interesante diferencia. ¿Por qué? Porque obviamente cómo los pequeños y medianos despachos o los grandes pueden acercarse a esta oferta tecnológica que hay es muy distinto. Porque para trabajar con tecnología hace falta recursos. Recursos humanos, recursos financieros, recursos de tiempo. Y ya sabemos que un pequeño despacho, un abogado que está solo, normalmente no suele tener tiempo, no suele tener exceso de recursos, a lo que sea muy bueno en una materia, pero si es muy bueno en una materia, lo que tiene es muchos clientes y por tanto vive en su pequeña reunión de En consecuencia, ¿cómo están pudiendo eh, beneficiarse o cómo están pudiendo afrontar los grandes despachos versus los pequeños y medianos, todo lo que está pasando pues es muy distinto. Eh, para los grandes, yo creo que esto puede ser hasta un hobby, algo para decir, oye, pues vamos a dedicar a un socio o a un equipo o contratamos un director de innovación y destinamos un recurso y probamos cositas. ¿no? Eso es un poco, 
hacia algún gran despacho, pues lo que yo veo que está pasando. Algunos van más avanzados, otros van menos, pero realmente sí puede llegar. Y por respecto a los pequeños, la situación es muy distinta. Pero es verdad que hay algunos despachos que están siendo muy innovadores porque han visto, sobre todo, y Marcus es muy especialista en esto, nos lo va a contar seguro mejor que yo, que aquel despacho que es más tipo boutique, muy supra especializado, sí que puede coger tecnología y convertirse en algo maravilloso, porque es lo mismo que hacía, pero parte de eso automatizado, eficiente, etc. Y por tanto, ser todavía mejor. <coughs> Después de explicarnos eh, los grandes y los pequeños, nos hablan sobre diferentes las tecnologías. ¿Por qué? Pues que aquí, cuando hablamos de Linatec, hablamos de una variedad enorme de tecnologías, incluso de paraguas de tecnologías, porque si hablamos de inteligencia artificial, así hablamos de inteligencia artificial, pero inteligencia artificial hay muchísimos tipos de tecnología. Alguna que ni siquiera existe y se habla de ella como si ya estuviera aquí, pero otra que ya está aquí y que es muy útil y que la podemos utilizar. Entonces lo interesante de la obra es que nos va a hablar sobre qué es la inteligencia artificial, qué es el blockchain, qué son los smart contracts, qué son las herramientas de automatización o aquellas que apoyan simplemente la gestión más profesionalizada de los despachos. Por supuesto hablan, hablan de Big Data, etc. Luego un apartado muy interesante es eh, el del análisis por país de lo que está pasando. Y para eso nos han pedido a una serie de expertos por país que escribieran un capítulo muy breve. No es que nosotras hayamos sido un poco vagas, sino que nos lo dieron muy limitado. De hecho, yo escribí como 100 folios y luego al final había cuatro para publicar. Pero bueno, es lo que hay. Y qué más deciros. Pues yo creo que nada más. La obra han participado personas con muchísimo nombre, pioneros y realmente eh, gente interesantísima. Así que yo simplemente pues, os animo a que ahorréis y que a muchos plazos compréis la obra, porque creo que merece el tema. Que lo compréis los esos despachos. Eso. Y eh, dicho esto, eh, pues lo que hemos pensado es que eh, vamos a hacer esto mmm, divertido, más tipo debate. Incluso nos encantaría que algunos de vosotros os animarais, participarais y nos corrigierais o aportarais valor a, a eso. Eh, let's start, we start with our question. How is technology impacting our sector? Do you think that lawyers will have to demonstrate, as today or yesterday our taxi drivers were demonstrating at the Castellana? What do you think about it? Marcus, can you give us your opinion about this? And we're going to see. Can I say some, some words about how that, that book came to life? Please, to do it. I, because I would, it was so great to listen to, to Maria and not, not understanding a word. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I have to start with an, with an apology. First thing is, my, my command of Spanish is really limited. So I'm very sorry that I can't speak Spanish with you, although I really like to listen to people who speak Spanish to each other because if you go to Italian or French or English, Spanish is, in my view, it's pure energy flowing. So it's really, <laughs> and I really like that. That's my first excuse. And my, my second is, Maria mentioned the price of the books, or I have understood. <laughs> and I saw the expressions on your face So please don't think that uh, here is a millionaire standing just you know <laughs> getting rich from the price of this book. These are two words that what authors and editors do and what a publishing house does. Uh, and the publishing house has a certain influence on authors and editors, but not vice versa. So we have no say in um, uh, deciding on What, what the appropriate price is for, for such a book. Um, so it's, it is as it is. But how, uh, let me just briefly explain how we came to this book. I'm, um, um, since, since 2010, I'm, I'm leading an, an institute at a law school in Germany, at the Cotelius Law School, and this institute uh, does not deal with law. It's, It's not a legal professor seat. It's an institute which analyzes legal markets and, and looks into the development of legal markets. And very early on in 2011 and 12, we realized that 
um, innovation is a topic in the legal profession which was not being dealt with. So we started to work with innovation in how law firms could change or modernize, if not uh, innovate, their, their legal services. Although many law firms on their home pages say we are so innovative, but if you look at it, you don't really understand why. And, and we wanted to understand that because the purpose of, of this institute is to provide advice to market participants, to law firms and to in-house legal companies and to other companies. And we then detected that technology could be an issue uh, early on and then we, we, we organized conferences and, and over time, within a very short time frame, because time is really running when it comes to technology, it's not 10 years and then something else happened. It's, it's happening every half a year, new things are happening. So we, we built up a reputation as being the point to go when it comes to the digital transformation of society. Um, and of course, of legal technology. And then in, in 2016, I thought legal tech was, was coming to a hype. Everyone was talking about legal tech and if you said, I'm organizing a conference with dealing with legal tech. All of a sudden, you have more than 200 participants. And I thought to, to sort of keep our reputation as being the leader, we have to write a book. Although legal technology, on the one hand, and a book, on the other hand, is not exactly that where you would think of. You would think of a homepage or a platform with articles, with more information, active communication with users. Um, but on the other hand, you know, if you can go to your parents and say, look, this is a book I've written, that's something they understand. And, and, and basically it's, so what we have brought up with the importance of books. So we decided to write a book, and it was pretty much clear that we can't do it all on ourselves. This book should be very practical, and it should be encouraging. It should not do away with the risks that are related to artificial intelligence and technologies. There are always risks um, connected with it. We wanted to encourage people to look at it and to, have an, to take part in an informed debate about the development of the legal profession and what technology does. Because at that time, you could read in the internet headlines like, Artificial intelligence will replace more than 50% of the lawyers within three years. And if you, if you would go into it, you, you wouldn't find any substance. But this headline, that does something with people. People get frightened. People identify innovation with threat and not with something which, which helps us to, to make the world a better place. Um, so and we, we, we wrote a, a German book first book of its kind. Um, and then when it was in, in the market, I have good international network. Many people said, look, you have some English chapters, but do you think of a translation of that book? Because you know, in German language, you have Germany, you have Austria and Switzerland, and maybe some parts in Russia along the Volga. But, but, but this is it. The German language is not a world language. And then we thought, just to write or just to produce a translation would not be enough. Why not do more? So we added the country reports, and we, we asked people from other countries to give a brief description what what is happening in Australia, what is happening in Estland, and, and all of a sudden you realize that is a global phenomenon. Although we have not from each country in the world a report, that proved to be uh, impossible, we have many reports from country and you see that the legal profession is on a global scale um, in, a, in a change mode. Um, and then we started to produce the, the, the international version. Um, we have asked our authors to again work on their chapters but bearing in mind that they are now writing for a global audience and not just a German audience. Um, and they, they did it. And of course, we had help of modern technology to produce the translation, because artificial intelligence is actually there. It is at your fingertips. You can make use of artificial intelligence today when it comes to translation of documents. So there is an example. Go to deepl.com. 
and you can produce translations which are stunningly exact. It's not, my, my, my research assistant is, is an English native speaker. Of course, if I give an English translation of a German text to her, she finds millions of ways to, to, to change it, or maybe even to amend it. Um, but for the first crack of translation, this software is very helpful, and it saved us cost for the translation of the book. So now it's there, we are pretty uh, uh, proud of it, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we realize that time is running. Would I do such an exercise again today? Probably I would say I would get more practical because in the meantime, this year and next year, people come up with questions like, but what are the next steps? So what do I have to do now? Where, to whom can I turn to? Is it just buying the software? And if so, which software? There is no journal, say a monthly journal, legal week monthly. <coughs> a journal like this and you would see, ah, oh, this is the new technology being presented. This doesn't exist. So people need practical guidance and help and tips. Um, maybe that's the next step of the, of the evolution. This is a combination of looking in theory of what is happening in the legal profession um, and how individual companies are working with legal technology. Big laws, small laws, the big four, uh, and we have a bit of technology. So I thought this is I a short. It's important, and maybe you want to tell us a little bit about you as a professional. About your career and your evolution? Yeah, I, well, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer by, 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 by education, and I started to work as a sole practitioner in Berlin that was before the wall came down. And um, <coughs> then I, I, I moved to a bigger firm because I felt frustrated as a sole practitioner, and, and this bigger firm grew. There, there was a merger of Mania in Germany, and my company where I was, Ottmar and Adler, merged and then merged with Linklaters. And at that time, I was the managing partner of a German firm. Um, and I, then I was German managing partner of Linklaters and had to organize the, the success of the development of Linklaters in Germany. <coughs> And I had three terms as managing partners and then made up my mind and asked, do you really want to have another term or isn't it time to do something new? Then I left the inflators and went to academia and today it's working at the Serious Law School and working as a lawyer. So it's a, it's a quite colorful bunch of flowers I'm, I'm working on. I, I get, I'm afraid if I do the same thing for quite some time, I get bored and need something new. So, so I, I combine practical work as a lawyer, academic work as working at the university, <coughs> and take an interest in the regulation of legal markets. So I'm uh, the chairman of a committee with these with professional regulation at the German Bar Association. Um, because in, in in, in Europe, all markets in Europe are in flux. And we take the market view, so the economic view, and we look at regulation in Europe and how it's being aligned and how countries like the UK with their very liberal approach <coughs> change the regulation in other European <coughs> countries. So for very conservative lawyers, they say, oh my God, good that the Brexit is coming so that the UK with their liberal approach to legal markets are no longer changing our system. Um, and that is interesting because many people, lawyers, startup companies, insurance companies, uh, banks, <coughs> other companies who want to get access to the legal market, which is an interesting market where you can be very successful. And these companies look at the lawyers and think, they don't have any entrepreneurial approach. If we would go into this market, we would be very successful. And therefore, the legal market is one of the last islands of, um, of, of opportunities. And many companies, whether it's in Spain or in Italy or in Germany or England, want to get access to it. So that's about me. But let's discuss, oh, one, one more sentence. I give, I give lectures on a regular basis. And I speak about, 
innovation and disruptive innovation and, and talk about why innovation and disruption is very often said as a synonym. We, we speak about disruptive innovation. And I then show pictures of taxi drivers protesting against black limousines or the forming, forming protest. And then I, I arrived yesterday at the airport and I realized there is a strike of taxi drivers. And I thought, this is my lecture in, in life. Uh, and then I, I, I took the metro, which is far more comfortable than taxi, and, and went to, to Madrid. And then I was in the internet and saw YouTube, people protesting and riots against. And I thought, that's, that's what digital transformation is all about at the moment. People protest against an app. Because what they, what they are protesting basically against is an app which helps, which brings people, customer, and drivers together. No one is replaced by software. It's just bringing people to make it a market, making a market transparent. And I was thinking, and that's what I always ask in, in my lectures, do we have to expect an Uber app for the new profession? Something which puts our profession so much under, under, under pressure that we are also protesting in Castellana or in Les Champs-Élysées or um, on Straße des 17 Juni uh, in Berlin, lawyers protesting against technology and innovation. And I found that very interesting how to, how to deal with this, with the need for innovation on the one hand and the requirements on the other hand to take care of the people who are affected by innovation or by technology um, and how to balance that out. Uh, people welcome in innovation and at the same time bear in mind there are people who are suffering from innovation because they're losing their jobs and their income and, and that we have to get to grips with that. And that was my lecture in the in live show yesterday and today. So, did you raise the question which I had forgotten? <laughs> 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 demonstrating themselves in Castellana against legal tech or against innovative uh, services models, <coughs> or they can keep calm and just, you know, come to these kind of lectures yeah. and read this book and then think a little bit and then maybe buy some software. What and should they be doing? I think, first of all, what I would encourage people is not get frightened by reading headlines like so and so many percent of lawyers will be replaced by artificial intelligence within a time frame of x years this is just crap this is crap because you know if you would ask a journalist who writes this whether he could give you a proper definition of what artificial intelligence is he would say i have no idea it's software isn't it? and we, we look at this, at the development of market and of, and of software without really knowing um, what we are talking about. So what is artificial intelligence doing? And as we tend to overestimate the impact of te technology today and, and underestimate the impact it may have in the future, we really believe everything we read. We think artificial intelligence is in the position to replace that what we are doing. But if you look at what, what artificial intelligence and software can do and what it can't do, there are severe differences. There is no software which can replace a profession <coughs> which has a quite complex task. If you have a profession where you have only one task, um, for example, bringing people from A to B, like a taxi driver, then self-driving cars could put you under pressure. You could be replaced by software and by systems which allow cars to drive through streets automatically. That may be in 25 years, we are getting closer to it, not today. Um, if, you, if you are a doctor and you are confronted with, um, with illnesses which doesn't happen very often, then artificial intelligence is helpful to identify <coughs> Um, other reports and studies with similar symptoms to help you to decide what exactly is these people suffering from. 
So software is helping the doctor to do a better job, but it doesn't replace the doctor by means of applying treatments, taking care of the people, and staying close to people who suffer from severe illnesses. And in law, of course, is software in a position to do things which lawyers like to do. For example, reading documents and writing economic details of documents on a piece of paper and selling this piece of paper to another person for a quite a high amount of money. Many lawyers do this, and they call it due diligence report. So if there is a software in place which is able to, to read a document, and to quote unquote understand the document, at least find out the economic relevant information of a document, and is then in a position to put this information on another piece of paper or on an Excel sheet and produce the first draft of a due diligence report, then that's a great thing, isn't it? Now, you could only be against it if you earn shed loads of money by doing it with lawyers, reading it and selling their time by the hour. And the more contracts you have to analyze, the better for the company. That has nothing to do with providing legal advice. A due diligence report has nothing to do with legal advice. It's just clarifying the facts. So this part of that what lawyers do can be replaced or greatly supported through software. And artificial intelligence software today is a software which has only one capability, which we uh, don't have in perfection. And that is, this software can compare. The software looks at data points and builds relationship between data points. Imagine face recognition. The software looks at your face and analyzes your face in data points, many points, and then draws lines between the points. And then you have a certain pattern. This pattern says, this is my face, Marcus Arthur. And then this software is able to go through thousands of photographs and find the same pattern of data points and their relations and say, oh look, I have found Marcus in so and so many other. And this is at your hands. If you have uh, an iPhone with Siri, if you have uh, your photos on your iPhone, if you just look for, say, violin, or you live in Madrid, the system will identify from your photos, photos where a violin is pictured. Just because this software detects data points and can for, compares it with other data points, that is what artificial intelligence is doing. But guys, let's think about what is intelligence? What is intelligence? It's not easy to, to explain what intelligence is. I, I have a definition of intelligence, and that is, I get an information, and, and I have experience or knowledge, and I build a relationship between the information and my knowledge. And then I give this information to someone with a recommendation, which I think, based on my experience and knowledge of the law or the facts, is the appropriate way forward. Or intelligence is to get the information, to have your experience, and then take a decision to do something. And then we would say, well, that was a very intelligent move. So and even more, <coughs> they able to act intelligently. There is no software in place which is able to do this. But there is software in place which recognizes data points. <coughs> and of course, the applicability for the legal sector is very high. For example, if you have a takeover of a company, and you do the due diligence, and you have to double check thousands of contracts because you want to know which certain warranty clauses are used by this company or whether the expiration dates of certain contracts are closed or what, what the value in certain contracts is. You would have a software detecting pattern in contracts and it would say, look, I have analyzed 10,000 contracts and in 9,000 contracts I have detected a certain pattern of clauses which is in line with the definition you gave me. Don't look at this, that's fine. There is only a thousand contracts left which you have to look at. So still you have to do it, but there is software helping you. Does it replace you only if you take pride in 
looking at documents and then writing the information of the document and saying, I have to be a lawyer to do that. So technology and artificial intelligence is a brutal teacher. It teaches us lawyers to think about what a lawyer should do and what he shouldn't do. And my rule of thumb is everything which can be replaced by software is something which lawyers shouldn't do. Um, so you might say, well, but technology is changing and is improving. You have these self-learning mechanisms and training mechanisms. The software learns by itself, and no one can really explain how. So does that really mean over time that what lawyers should do is changing? And I would say, oh, yes. It changes with doctors. It changes in every profession. Every profession changes its focus and abilities and the requirements to all sorts of professions are changing again and again. And only we lawyers should claim that since one century, things are very similar and will not change in the next century. That's not very realistic. So I would encourage people, and that's what we did with this book, to, to open up your mind and heart and look at technology and find out where technology helps you to be a better lawyer. Better by means of providing better service at a more competitive price to clients if you're a lawyer. So to combine technology and human services to something where clients would say, oh great, this, this exceeds my expectations. Or offer an interface to clients that they get 24-7 access to your services and can download certain information, contracts, contracts generators, and all these things. And when it's getting difficult, where you need someone with judgment, with complicated cases, then you pick up the phone and call your lawyer. So I would encourage you to realize that technology is greatly supporting what you do, like word processing. Um, but it helps you also in generating legal documents and find out what really is your personal value as a lawyer. And that's the great challenge for the legal profession as it's traditionally not very innovative as a profession. Um, Can I say something? Oh, yeah, sorry. What you're saying is, is very nice, but I fear that a lot of people, um, when they if they try to do what you're suggesting, are going to be completely frustrated. Why? Because of budgets? Because the level of maturity of many of these tools you're mentioning, like the ones that can do the millions, etc., super expensive and they're not easy to feed because they have to be fed by somebody. Somebody needs to tell the machine what she needs to learn in order to be applicable to the kind of contracts that are in Spanish, for Spanish, etc. So I think that we, okay, we should invite everybody to join this movement because I think you have to know about it, but we have to be very careful and tell the people the truth. As far as I know, for instance, in Spain, several law firms are using, I'm not going to mention the technologies, a couple of um, Anglo-Saxon uh, artificial machine learning tools to do exactly what you were saying, but there is a bit of frustration in many of these law firms. A lot of people uh, are necessary to, the machine is not working very well because it has been trained for English. So let's be careful with us because we, you said at the beginning, don't be scared, so we don't want them to jump into the pool mm -hmm. and then like, you know, <laughs> knock their, their foreheads. Yes. Then I think it's because the pool is different for everyone. Exactly. And I think the problem is that people just entering legal tech because of the hype, because of everything that is being said, obviously, I mean, if you're, um, mm -hmm. many, many, most of the legal techs are going to be appropriate with your specific case. So uh, start with legal tech, I would say, just by what you are, what you're doing, and small, with your really uh, use case, something that's really very similar uh, to what you're doing, and then grow from there. Just don't try to, uh, okay, I'm small, I never do uh, mergers and acquisitions, but I'm going to have uh, Luminance and start uh, selling my services, because uh, I know that Luminance can, do, uh, can process documents in seconds. I mean, uh, I think the problem is that um, it's true that we might be uh, talking too much about all this, so people are having expectations that uh, we need to lower at the same time as encourage. So, and I think that this precisely this book is about, and you're being very 
uh, self-critical, saying that if you had to do it again, you would do it more practical. But I think there is not one solution for, for no. all of us. So uh, that's why I really think this book and it's good that it is printed because it makes sense. I mean, a practical one would be changing all the time. Uh, it could be like playing the mementos and you need a yearly edition because it's changing all the time. This is not, I mean, what you have written in the book and our very small edition, but all the editions of everyone, I think this uh, is really, it's not that it's theoretical as and practical, but I think uh, it's food for thought for uh, anyone who is interested in, in legal tech. And it's not going to, I think it's going to help to precisely not jump into this pool that is not yours. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, that, 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 that seems to be so clear. Uh, the legal technology or the digital transformation of society or of, or of your firm actually does not consist of buying software and thinking with the software things will change. You know, you can only make use or proper use of software if you have processes which are standardized and have the potential to be automatized. If that is not the case, if you work, say, on really on high-end transactions and your task is to be the one to sit next to the CEO and give him advice of what to do in certain situations, if you know important players in the market of the competition authority and of the tax authority, and you are sort of the, the conciliator of someone, if that is your legal job, then you probably only need a good database and a good work processing system, if that is your job. But I think the amount of lawyers or the percentage of lawyers working like this is pretty small. The percentage of lawyers who do things with a certain repetitive element, or who sell services and contracts and systems more than once, is pretty significant. And I would always encourage people to look at the way their work, point one, and look at that what their clients expect. And then you may find that there are certain processes in your practice, for example, in, uh, in company law, corporate law or in real estate transactions where you can make use of software and the evidence would be many other companies dealing with real estate transactions make use of softwares. Um, but it's, there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Probably really each law firm is different and has a certain culture and is, you know, even linked at some fresh fruits which are very close competitors. <coughs> are not so similar if you look at their internal corporate governance and, and, and processes and so on. Um, so that's the point. So the point is how do we produce our work and how do we sell it to our clients? And if that is something where software doesn't play a sensible role, you shouldn't even think about it. But you will probably detect if you work in capital markets or if you work in banking, we have so many standards and precedents and things which are generated again and again and again. Their software may help and help to ease processes in the firm and to develop legal products for clients. And there are many examples in the book and in my lecture that if you read blogs, you find many examples of all sort of different things, so you you both are right. There is no one recite you could take and then, okay, this is my master plan, my blueprint, and now I'm following exactly this line. That doesn't work. First point is to look at your practice and get to know your practice and analyze your practice. Why are you doing things like this? Why don't you have a firm-wide know-how system? Why don't you have a firm-wide agreed corporate contract, for example. Why do every, does every partner of your firm sells his own style of contracts to clients? Why don't you have a certain consolidation of your data? All these things which every law firm has to deal with um, yeah. before you buy software. In my opinion, the, the pillar of any <clears throat> digital project should be people. I will not start with the practice. I will start with people. I would really analyze 
who I have in my law firm, who is ready to change, who is ready to learn, who is ready to invest time in something different than being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody there? Do I have some, maybe some outside help? Do I know any consultants, somebody who can come and help me? Because to me, the key factor is people. Then, clients. Clients are also super important. Clients have changed. Consumers are not consumers, they are prosumers. They are different. They want transparency. They want immediate answer. Mm -hmm. They want information. They want to understand the price. They want to know how much it's going to cost. They want cheap prices because they know that others are being cheap. So clients are important. But maybe not my clients of today are not my clients of tomorrow. That's why I emphasize always that I think that there is an opportunity now to really create new business. Maybe your practice of today is not your practice of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you have the right people and you find the right opportunity and the right technology, maybe you can create a new practice, a new law firm, a new service, and there are many opportunities now. Now is the time to do it. So that's why I think that people first, clients second, because for me people are necessary, that many of course, and, and then and then the rest. Then processes and technology and, <coughs> and that's my point. And you agree with the people first, I mean it's client first. And I think it may be the I mean comparing with the tax drivers. I mean the taxes have thought about their clients. And then we would not be where we are. And they would not be where they are. Um, a client had had a nice car. Yeah, but in somebody, car. somebody had decided once, I'm a guy from Malaga that I met once from Cabify, he's in his 40, super intelligent, a teleco engineer. He decided, I don't want this company. So you need people first. That's what I mean with people. You need an entrepreneur who has the vision. It's a That's the people I mean. An interesting theoretic discussion whether the hand first or the egg first. Of yeah. course, you need people to do great jobs for clients, and you need clients to have something with what you can pay your people. So it's uh, I, I, no, I, but I, I, it's not it's not theoretical. It's practical. I really believe because I'm doing, I'm helping law firms and I'm helping in-house uh, departments. Yeah. And how do we do it? We first start with people. We make a photo of what we have because if you don't have the right people. I mean, I can come with the best technology, but the technology is going to be in a box because nobody is going to use it because clients don't need it. So that's why I say that people first. Yeah, I think our our fight is that we are seeing too many uh, firms and clients uh, like having looked already at I don't know how many uh, tools, legal tech tools, but um, and are frustrated. Yeah. I mean. A lot of tools are in boxes, not I mean, many yeah. law firms buy management software and they never, I, 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 can give you, I cannot give you names, but I tell you, every uh, month I meet somebody who is frustrated because they got this software and then nobody is using it, they don't want to use it, it's and that's the big frustration in many law firms. I understand. Yeah. So don't buy the book because it's, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just too early. The, the, no, on the contrary, buy and read the time. Read the time. No, uh, read the time. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's interesting. So I, I I would be interested in that. What would you have to say about it? I mean, you are here because you you take an interest and you come. What I heard from from different firms with different levels of sophistication when it comes to technology. So Baker McKenzie, for example, is quite far ahead. Uh, with their level of technology, and and there are other uh, maybe even Spanish firms who have made great progress in in doing this. But what is your take on this? Do you think it's just future and interesting to talk about? But it's it's not in real life. It won't happen within the next five to ten year, years, at least not before you retire from practice. So it's, <laughs> you you don't have to be concerned about, or do you think oh, I'm threatening, but I don't. Would it? I think it's very real, but I mean, in our case, we are very sophisticated, as you said. I mean, we are a global offer. So, in our case, we have a global program. We have we invest a lot of money. We have a global team mm -hmm. uh, looking for technology every day and testing different things and then applying those that are more relevant for us. So, it's, I think it's, it's quite different. In our case, it's much more, and as you said before, for us, I mean, 
Everything that is related to technology is efficiency, but innovation is much more than technology. Mm -hmm. So now we are much more looking into other aspects yeah. of the, you know, the creation, more yeah. than related to services, products, how to approach the market, the ecosystem engagement with startups and other yeah, relevant players. That, because we have an open system. I mean, alone, we are nothing. We have to collaborate with the academia, with universities, with uh, legal techs, with uh, startups, in order to, because we need legal tech for the future. I mean, we are sure mm -hmm. we need it. In order to better, better serve our clients and meet their expectations, because they won't, I mean, they, they won't pay for things that have no value. Yeah. They just pay for things that are really, you know, uh, that need your brain. Yeah, for example, many many companies have to take risk management decisions day by day. So for them, life is not black or white. They they always are running into risk and doing an assessment: can I go down that route or not? And turning to a lawyer, it's it's often not very helpful because they they are not trained in giving a risk management decision. For them, if there is a risk, it's to the client to decide. Um, so, but if you would have a software combining artificial intelligence or comparing and big data, and you could give a data-based recommendation to a board whether it makes sense to further pursue a claim or to rather enter into a settlement, because you have data analyzing court decisions, thousands of court decisions on the outcome in certain cases and their peculiar peculiarities. So if you could give a risk management decision or recommendation to the board which is data-based, you would set a certain standard where the say, traditional lawyer with his experience of 50 cases, or let it be 100 cases, falls far behind. And that is where, where software sets standards where clients say, oh look, law firm A, came and they, they provided not only their best gray hair partners with his personal experience, but they had a software-based analysis and database and they gave us, for our good business judgment rule, data-based information where we can base our risk management decision on. So when we get in trouble with our shareholders, we have many arguments why we took this decision and not that decision. So we are not saying, well, that was the gut feeling of Mr. A, who is a very recommended and highly reputed lawyer. That is nothing you should base a, a risk management decision on. And you know, that is for that you don't have to change your firm. You only you have one department making use of it of these types of software. So legal tech may affect your entire firm, and you're right, then you need people who are willing to use it. And it gives tools to, to litigation partners, which just helps them to do a better risk assessment. And the rest of the firm remains as it is, as traditional, as uninnovative, as undigital as it is. So you even can combine it. it it's, it's different from firm to firm. I think it's time to introduce this debate we had today, remember, when we were talking about, because that kind of tools, of course, you, you have them already in the market. Marcus Huber has Dreametria and there are many others. So that, that's happening already. But there are other tools, which are the new generation, which are amazing. You have your document ready, and then you put it in, and then the machine tells you, OK, you forgot this uh, decision, and you forgot this law, and you forgot. So it helps you. It can do your work. Um, so I was telling them this morning, um, do you think that that is going to impact in our intelligence, in our capacities? Because, I mean, we will need less decision-making capacity, the machine will tell us how to do things. At the moment, we still keep on researching, and then we appraise different options, and then finally we yeah. decide that this is going to be our strategy in mitigation. And in the opinion. future, uh, excuse me? I have an opinion. I, okay. think, I think this could be called uh, predictive skills. Yeah, these are predictive skills. Which and means we, that um, the advantage for, okay, the law firm is directly connected to the customers. They are customers, so they have to solve the problems of the customers. Um, 
And so they can do it either uh, acting on the customer directly, but also empowering the uh, lawyers uh, with the uh, predictive abilities. And this is already existing. Mm -hmm. So it basically is big data, it's smart data, we call it smart data. So if you are able to analyze, to <coughs> handle uh, a massive quantity of data and uh, um, identify the variables, uh, with statistics, and, uh, and find the KPIs, this you, I mean, by this you can empower lawyers yeah. to be yeah, able but the to better decide. Is that decide. going to empower us, or is that going to diminish our capacity? Because no, no, you won't have to decide. The machine is telling you this no. is the best law, this is the best oh. position, this is. What is happening is before that. I mean, uh, normally the decision that the machine takes is a, is a, the result of an analysis, a previous analysis. Because if you are able to analyze the situation and to analyze the situation is very, very difficult. So today, we can handle maybe two, three, four variables when we decide. Therefore, you, you normally say, okay, what is the forecast, sales forecast for next year? Okay, we, we should increase 10%. How do you do that? Oh, we increased last year 10%, so this year maybe as well. So this is a very little variable. But if you have a machine uh, enabling, I mean, helping you um, understand, I mean, handling 1,000 variables, then you will never be able to get there. I mean, a human kind, human being will never be able to get there. Yeah, but that's what we are saying. We're all you going to do the same thing. thing. Exactly. We'll be all homogeneous. All, mm -hmm. all lawyers will get to the same result. Because if I have a machine wow. who can find the solution for me, because this machine already exists. Yeah, but yeah, I've, the, I've the variables, the var the the variables are the same because no. they're going to go into court, they're going to go into court decisions, they're going to go into the same laws, and they're going to tell you this is the best because this court always uh, says this because we all have bias. Also, uh, uh, judges have bias. So when they analyze that, they are going to tell you, okay, for this judge, this is the best strategy. But he is the counterpart, he, he's, he's the leader of the counterpart, he's going to get the best solution. So that's what I'm saying, it's going to be a very boring world, as far as I see that, yeah? maybe I'm wrong, where we all are going to come to the same kind of... Well, I, I think that the other way around, and I say um, the reality is so multifaceted. I mean, each company has, a, has specific needs. So you have banks, you have hospitals, you have or whatever. So, I mean, customers of law firms are so different, and you need to personalize normally the offer, the, the service. And uh, you first need uh, a system to understand the, the, the specific need, and then you can implement the solution by adding tools, standard tools, whatever. But also, you need to personalize these tools. So, it's not so the same for everybody. So I think that the, the lawyer might um, uh, rely on his capability to predict or to analyze the situation, and this should be the value that he can or she can add to the market. It is, I mean, Marina and I, I have to say, I'm afraid I, I disagree with you. Um, I think your, your take on what mm. technology can provide is a bit uh, too mechanistic. Um, let, let's take an example, and, and, and we have this exercise of this. Uh, this but example of Isabella. Center it on judicial, because I'm not talking about any kind of services. I'm talking about yeah. litigation. I take this example. Litigation. Look, eh? There is a system in the United States, and obviously it, it exists in other parts of Europe as well, which is able to read a law claim, a, a lawsuit, and the attachments, and understand the claim and the peculiarities of the case, and then looks for court decisions which fit to this case and give you a curated list of reading, saying <coughs> you can defend yourself better if you refer to these court decisions, and here are a couple of other court decisions which may help, but are not a must-have. So basically, this software helps you to do that what a good associate you know, your client comes to you, says, I have been sued, here are all the papers, and you give it to your excellent associate and say, do some research and help me to get the resources of court holdings, literature, and everything. And there is a software doing this. 
Now, if you would think that when the case is done, that is not how litigation works. It just helps people to find all resources and relied, uh, related court decisions to have a more informed view on how the case should be decided. But it, as you said, it's multifaceted. There hasn't been any lawsuit, any case, which was a, a complete 100% copy of another case. There are elements <coughs> which can be decided with reference to a certain court decision, whether you have disclosed documents, for example in a given situation. And that may help you by winning the case, but it doesn't help you to win the case. It may help you. And it doesn't win the case as such. So I'm not so pessimistic I would encourage people to make use of this software because the expectations of insurance providers, for example, who provide liability insurances to lawyers, at the moment they say a lawyer is, does not act negligently if he reads legal journals on a regular basis and keeps himself informed of what's going on, and if he missed something and lost the case, well, that's human fate. Maybe in some years, insurances would say, we raise the bar. We expect lawyers to use intelligent databases before they deal with cases and not just read one legal journal a month and think that they are well prepared to handle lawsuits. So, the, the requirements uh, are, are being raised and getting more complicated. So, like it or not, as a litigator, you have to make use of this software and look at this software. And when it comes to due diligence, so the analysis of documents, it's clients who tend to put pressure on you just by pricing, by saying, I only pay a certain lump sum for the due diligence, and I don't pay it on an hourly basis. At that moment, the law firm has to think like an entrepreneur. I have a fixed price, and how do I manage to generate a profit margin and still keep the mandate? That's what every entrepreneur has to do day by day, who sells his products by a fixed price and has to combine and manage his resources in a way that in the end he makes a profit. That's entrepreneurship. If you can build your services by the hour, you don't have to be an entrepreneur. You can sit hours and hours and hours by saying, well, the client pays for that. But that is not a sustainable business model. And technology helps you to detect that there may be certain services of lawyers where clients are happy to pay by the hour. Things which are based on personal experience, and I'm keen that you do a certain research and get back to me. And if you want to have 10,000 euros for that, I'm happy to pay that. But not for your young people and your paralegals and your associates and all the parts of the bill which blow the bill up to incredibly hates, which no one wants to pay. And that is what technology helps us to better understand. It forces us to understand. And there is, I think, no way of saying, I live in an island and I have my clients. My clients don't like technology at all. Um, I, I haven't seen it. So one way or the other, we have to deal with it. And whether you have the big route to technology or do it step by step for certain individual practices or partners, depends on how your firm looks like and your resources look like, your people look like. And it will anyway start being a competitive advantage. I mean, now it's it is, I mean, now it is starting to, uh, to increase the gap between uh, firms investing in tech and firms not investing in tech, uh, because uh, those who already have and use legal tech are quicker, um, and they can be uh, more accurate, but then once everybody has it, I think it's, it's going to be like that, it's going to be compulsory, and I think I don't remember exactly the news, but uh, there has been already a ruling in Canada. Have you read this? Of the judge ruling that. Uh, yeah. Oh, do yes. You, can you explain? Because I An interesting <laughs> ruling uh, where the, there was a lawsuit, and, and at the end, it only, uh, the, the judge had to deal with the cost of the case, who had to bear the cost of the case. And, and, and the winner of the case, a lawyer had a, a ridiculous high bill with many details on it. And the, and the judge looked at it 
and said, piece by piece, stroke it out, and said at one point, here he could have uh, made use of artificial intelligence software. I'm not sure whether this judge has ever come across software, but he just said this, it was research of facts, could be done by software. Um, and he, and he um, cut the bill, and then in the end it was only a very small amount which the other party had to pay. So maybe using technology and uh, using the most cost efficient means or ways to, uh, to support and serve your clients will be a certain standard where judges say, if I would have to decide on the level of cost the other party had to pay, I would have a look at the cost to decide whether it's ridiculous or whether it's the, the sum of the most cost efficient and effective way of producing your services. Now this was an individual case in Canada and lawyers in Canada saw it, oh God, it's, <laughs> it's, not, yeah, it's, it's not the new normal, but it, um, it was very prominent in, in blogs, yeah. but very, very interesting. Do yeah. you want to pose us any question or to move? Sorry, <laughs> I have another case, which is, imagine in employment law, for example, so a company has strong difficulties because they have a lot of extra hours. And uh, so they say that the employers and the unions, trade unions, they, they go against the company. The company wants to cut the extra hours, mm -hmm. but you know, the workers don't, don't want to. So how should act a judge in that case? So you go through the normal standard procedure, so okay, fine, you look for the information, you find some information, you go to the court, okay, judge, and then if you, if you apply the big data, for example, and you apply to the to the company's uh, uh, processes, you find out that these were not extra hours, but these were just the way that the company was always working, had been working from the very beginning. And the result is uh, extra hours cut by 50%, company saved a lot of money and the judge said I like this technology and the, the trade union said we like this technology because from the savings that the company had the company decided to invest 50% in the employers in the, sorry, in the workers by a variable uh, compensation system and the rest the company kept for the balance and so everybody was happy and that was um, possible via the big data uh, technology. And again, so the, the difficulty of the, the, the lawyer would have been, how, how can I define, how can I see whether these were extra hours or not? And so met hundreds of variables, impossible. But at the end, so the lawyer said, we like this technology, so we're going to apply that to other cases. So this is possible. And, and, the, and these lawyers, now the value of these lawyers is that they are growing their technology uh, portion. No, somebody said, in time. So I think this can add value. Talking about the, the book, uh, you said before that uh, you analyzed uh, the situation in some several countries. I really would like to know your opinion about uh, the situation from uh, from Spain. Oh, can I ask these two ladies who are co-authors <laughs> and they have offered the part on Spain? So, could you give this gentleman an overview of where uh, Spain stands? So, what worries you? Because I mean, we talk about the situation. We can talk about many things. What worries you? What would you like to know? About how is the market right now? Well, in the com comparison with the other countries. Like in many other countries, there is a lot of marketing, so a lot of bubble, a lot of people talking about it, but if you want to like make a list of use, uh, business cases and real cases, the list is not short, so long. Um, you have some very interesting cases. Um, I can give you some names of companies which in our opinion are really pioneering, innovating, and making good business. For instance, Reclamador, for me, is a successful business case. 
is a guy, uh, you guys might know the case, but yeah, sure. okay. So this guy, for instance, uh, you might not know that, um, is the company, this is the company and not the law firm that has uh, placed more um, excuse me? Yeah, lawsuits, lawsuits uh, in, in courts uh, in, in the la last year. Mm -hmm. I think if I recall correctly, 22,000 uh, lawsuits, and he has done that with uh, 20 lawyers, mm -hmm. not 1,000 lawyers, not 400. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and exactly, that's what I wanted to say, but he has got a team of 22, I think, uh, developers, plus he made an investment last year of 900 euros or 600 euros in in a software mm -hmm. that allows them to, uh, with, based on artificial intelligence, that has automatized, <coughs> automatized excuse me, the, the, the process of uh, claim uh, intake uh, up to the core. He tried to connect the system to all the different regional um, litigation systems that the, 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 the courts, and of course it was impossible because you probably know the conflict we have with the different uh, management uh, systems of the different uh, regions of Spain, mm -hmm. but he managed to do it with some, and he, he wants to do that, so that, that's an incredible business case. We have a lot of um, examples of platform for lawyers to get uh, clients. I don't know, probably I'm wrong, but I don't think that any of these platforms is doing booming business. I don't really believe in the kind mm -hmm. of platforms. They are also- They are just- um, uh, sorry, leads. Mm -hmm. they, they are not uh, in value yet. Even the, 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 the lawyers and the clients. clients. And there, there is still a gap between the lawyer and the, and the, and the client. Exactly. And yeah. it's just a matter of faith. Yeah. Yeah. There are some interesting uh, examples of uh, automatization for contracts and documents, and we have, like, uh, probably you know them, Microvato, Wonder Legal, we have. Uh, Espresso, so, so several Spanish, Le Balibu. Le Balibu. so we have several companies of this type, so that's, that's quite interesting. Yeah, I think actually, especially in Spain, we have like too many right now in several. Uh, too many lawyers or too many? <laughs> too many lawyers, too many lawyers, and too many legal We have too many. I mean, I think the market is not as major as it would be in other countries, so now many people are trying many things. Novel, but then I guess uh, only the the really uh, good ones are, will remain. But we're still in the phase of like everybody trying to. And uh, if you have a look, you have several uh, start legal tech startups that are not working anymore. That was launched like one two years ago. And what about the investment value investment? Uh, How much you know, money has been invested in? Yeah, you know, like there are no, no real numbers. I mean, yes. everything in the, uh, let's say, the directories of legal tech, because the, is everything is like this. Some people, some of us, I mean, there are like four or five people, we're researching, we go over this, but nobody is sitting in a university really working only in this. Therefore, we all make our best, but there is nothing I can say is perfect. Because besides, it's evolving very, very fast, uh, so it's, it's difficult to know. So work for management of law firms. There are many, many, many initiatives. There is a representative here of a very interesting initiative which has the ambition of becoming mm -hmm. the best software for law firms, for solo lawyers, which are very abandoned by sometimes the big uh, <coughs> software companies. Um, and, we in, and of course, you have specialized tools like for data protection, for compliance, and, um, and it's booming and it's growing. And like every, I, I told you, like, uh, we will launch very soon uh, a, a platform that will let you compare legal tech, and we have made a list of uh, around 300 tools for different purposes. Also, the public ones, because the public sector is doing very interesting things. The judges are, are giving us tools, the social security is giving us tools, the tax authority are giving us tools. So we are trying to not only put the, uh, the private sector initiatives, but also the public ones, because they, they help us lawyers, like calculation of indemnization, this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. and the problem is still being uh, the data. There is still the open data issue here. That, uh, that say it doesn't improve. Uh, many people can do many things. Yeah, what, I mean, what I heard with regard to data, indeed, so if you have 
an algorithm for, uh, for artificial intelligence to do document review. You need data, data, data to train that. There is not an individual law firm having enough data. So my, <coughs> my recommendation to law firms is you have to join forces yeah. and you share your data. So to anonymize your data, and then to share your data and jointly develop an algorithm which you may use, only you group of firms. The standard reaction is, uh, well, these are all competitors. We, we, we can't join forces with them. We are better because our algorithm has been trained better than other firms. That is only a short-term gain. On the long-term, law firms should sort of found common data centers to train their algorithm and then compete there where law firms should compete, not on the technology side. But it's, in Austria, seven firms have joined forces, but they are still very skeptical when it comes to sharing of data because there is no software which reliably uh, anonymize data, there is still a risk that you do not comply with the uh, GDPR um, uh, rules, so that's a high risk. But on uh, long term, I would encourage all the leading Spanish law firms to join forces and take some of the South American law firms on board to share the Spanish-speaking documents to train and develop an algorithm which these firms mm -hmm together may use for serving their clients. That sounds weird, but I don't see any other way to get enough data to train algorithm in a language which has a huge market potential. I think Spanish-speaking countries is the second largest population, or is it Chinese first, no, then in Spanish? In, uh, in business communication is the second largest. In business, uh, so if you have but to it's, invest, not, it's not only it's because, because uh, otherwise you won't make it, it's also because of resources. Because th these are tools that are still too expensive, but if they all get together, yeah. they, can, uh, yeah. they can afford it. So they that's not, with also a very are, important reason. They are not that expensive. Yeah. So, well, uh, we have maybe to for the German market, I thought, uh, remember that this market is a market where I think it's around 97% of the law firms are solo lawyers, one, two, three lawyers. It's not, it's not like in Germany. Remember how many lawyers we have. This is a very different market know, to the German a, market. I'm, I'm aware of the timing. Uh, as soon as we get yes, yes, now yes, 90 yes, minutes in this, not very no. long. <laughs> but it's so interesting. Thank you so much for your, for your, for your interest. Um, if, if, if there are more questions, of course, I'm happy to answer them by telephone or email. So if you give me your email address, I can keep you informed. And otherwise, if you don't go for these expensive books, <laughs> there are many there are many blogs and 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 homepage where you can get regular information and keep up to date. At least there is the Elta, <coughs> which is very active in Spain, I must say. Which we will present on February. Yes. Thank you very much.